Welcome to the Mike Clegg YouTube channel. Um, my aim with this channel is to talk about all things football, health and well-being, but most importantly, to have fun. Um, yesterday on Twitter, I posted um, some questions, uh, what people would like to ask. Um, but, but before we get into that, um, in the future, we'll be talking about the seven dimensions of health, and that is the physical, emotional, intellectual, social, environmental, occupational, and even the spiritual side of life. So I'm really excited to um, discuss all my history within playing football, work as a strength and conditioning coach, and now as somebody who's gonna be out in the community trying to educate people in lots of different areas. And without doubt, an introduction has got to start with my, my time as a, as a young lad growing up in, in Ashton Underline. Um, I had some amazing years down there. Um, I'm the eldest of, of five. Um, and my life has always been involved in sport. Uh, my dad opened the gym when I was six years old in Ashton, the Olympic sport gym, which we still have now. And it's just been a case of going through a life where there was always an opportunity to improve myself, always an opportunity where I was able to express myself. And um, through that environment, I was lucky enough to ultimately end up playing football for Manchester United, but through the journey which we'll discuss, I'm sure, in the future, there's been so many ups and downs with an amazing um, family, my brothers who become athletes, and um, all the way to now where my son, hopefully, will become an athlete himself, or, or just become the happiest person on earth. I've got two amazing sons, Rafe and Gabe. So, going back to today, the first day, I'm obviously very nervous, really excited about doing this. Um, I want as much interaction as possible with um, my followers and my subscribers and I'm looking forward to taking your questions. Um, so we'll start with that. And um, the first question was from the Academy Review, and they've asked me, in the Academy, which players do you think would make it, and which players surprise you? So I suppose they talk about me back in the day, uh, when I was playing there in the Academy then. Um, and my year was an interesting year. We were two years behind the class of 92. So we just seen the great success of David Beckham and Paul Scholes and all the lads who had fantastic success and they certainly deserved it. So our year was a bit different. We was almost like the ragged dolls really. I don't think much was expected from us. Um, but what we did create and what Eric Harrison and Pop Robson created was a real good team spirit and we really were a hard working bunch of lads. And um, we, we actually won the Youth Cup, uh, which was a major, major surprise. And that was something which I'm one of, probably one of the, in the top five of my proudest days. But within that group, who was really good? We had David Johnson, he ended up playing for Nottingham Forest and Ipswich. We had Terry Cook, who played some first team games for Man United, ended up going to Sunderland. And they ended up getting a really bad injury, um, and then w went working out in, in America. Other players, Paul Heckenbottom, a great friend of mine, he ended up becoming a manager and he did a really successful time at Barnsley, more recently at Leeds. Um, David Gardner, um, a young player with tons of talent, he's ended up being Dave Beckham's best friend and he's out there in America living the dream, so to speak. I think he's even married Liv Tyler. So there's been amazing people within that um, group of people and some people who unfortunately didn't even end up having careers. So the short answer to that is within that group, I don't think many of us was expected to do really well, but a few of us have carved out careers and that's what it's all about in a youth team. You never know where it's gonna go and there's always surprises. Okay, the next question again, um, from David Gibson. At your time at Sunderland Football Club, who was the most professional in terms of their approach to training in the gym? Great question. Um, I actually know David, he, um, he's, he lives in Sunderland and I know him through me being at Sunderland for the last 12 years as the head of strength and conditioning. Um, so, you know, there's been a lots of good players over the years who, who've been at Sunderland and a lot of the time players who come, some players are up in the standard from lower league levels and they're wanting to really impress and play in the Premier League. You get lads coming through who are trying to, uh, who are on loan, who want to become the best they can be. And you're also getting lads going through the system. So through all that, you've got plenty. Jermaine Defoe, top professional, knows how to look after himself. Very, very good in around the change rooms. We had John O'Shea, where's Brown obviously come from Man United. Again, quality around the, um, uh, the training ground. They really knew what they did. And there was like captains and managers within themselves. But really, when I look back and I look at my success as an SNC coach, I start to think of Jordan Henderson and I start to think of Jordan Pickford, 
who were two young players come through the system. Um, they got to a point, Jordan Henderson especially, where he was 15, 16, not quite sure where his career was going to go in the sense of the, the coaches wasn't sure would he have the physicality to make it as a Premier League player. But us in the medical department, strength and conditioning department said, looking at him physically, he needs time to grow, time to grow into his body. His skill level was unbelievable. And we actually allowed him to play in a lower year group than his actual year group. But once he got that, what's called the growth spurt, he ended up becoming a top player. Roy Keane allowed him to get a first team appearances. And obviously we all know that Jordan Henderson kicked on, been at Liverpool for years now, England international and even captain and uh, full respect to John Anderson for everything he's done and in the same respects um, Jordan Pickford now is at Everton and he's a top top performer with such good mental resilience and uh, a solid lad. Next question is from Jamie Wilson. Um, he's asked me, looking back at your playing days at Man United, who was your footballing role model and how did you get any and did I get any good advice that you remember as a youngster at Man United? Well, I think again, there were so many when I was there. Uh, I was lucky in a sense, I got picked up quite late. I was 15. Um, I used to play for Duckingfield Tigers, who was a young, um, quite average team in my area. And I know they've been doing some great work within the youth for years and years now. But I moved to a team called Drawlsden. Drawlsden was a top team back in the day. Um, and that every single player in that squad of 11 all got a professional contract. I was the captain of that team and I was the only one who wasn't even with the team and I thought my time has gone. Um, uh, very lucky, a scout called Brian Poole, who I need to give major, major credit for, he scouted me right near the end of um, my fifth year at senior school and he said, I've seen something about you which is special, it's different, come down for a trial at Man United, which I did, I played against Blackpool. Um, Dave Bushell was the, the manager. He was the old England under 16s manager. He gave me a trial, played against Blackpool. I scored. I was like, I was like a man possessed. I put on that Man United strip, and it was like, wow, I feel like a million dollars. And um, I loved it. I played six more games. And suddenly, then I'm thrust into being at Man United. I'm at the cliff. I'm in Salford. I go into the um, changing rooms, and I had to go and see the physio because it's like my first time there. On the bed was Brian Robson. On the bed was. Um, Dion Dublin, and Paul McGrath, I'm like, wow, these are like my heroes. And you're walking around and I was like scared to death, but also it's an environment you had to flourish. But as you sort of get yourself used to the environment and you start understanding what you need to do, Dennis Irwin, what a legend he is. If I could have chosen anyone to have um, been like, it would have been Dennis. I'm a similar height to Dennis, similar build, but his technical ability was amazing. He took free kicks, he took penalties, he scored a, a whole raft of goals. And the way he was as a person, you know, he, when he had to say something and get his point across, he could do it with sternness. But in a general sense, he was always giving and a guy who really wanted um, the team to do well. So Dennis Irwin, legend. Next question. Do you remember doing junior football team presentations nearly 20 years ago at Romilly Stockport? Well, again, as a, as a young pro at Man United, um, there's a lot of people who want to have the service of somebody coming down doing a presentation, and I loved it. I loved it when Lynn Laffin, who was um, Alex Ferguson's um, personal secretary, she used to sometimes ask the players to go and do, can you do this gig, can you do this um, shot, can you go and do this for the school? And sometimes the players didn't want to do it, they were too busy, they had families. I was a young lad, 19, 20 years old, I didn't have a wife, I didn't have children, and I was, what, somebody is willing to take me to go and speak to some children or do a presentation? It was amazing, I loved it. And um, again, you know, I do remember going to, um, to Romilly and I do remember doing presentations at schools and I look back at them being the really proud moments of something what I give back to the community. So yeah, I remember doing stuff like that and I wanna do more. I'll tell you one story, just to finish on that point. Me, Ben Thornley got the opportunity because we did so much for the club to go and play in a, a charity match. It was a, um, a match in Italy in Milan. We had the opportunity to go and play for the Versace fashion wear um, um, establishment against Armani, against a radio station and against a TV station. They flew me and uh, Ben out and also Chris Woods, who used to be the England um, goalkeeper. And they were like, what was going on? We didn't really know, everything was a bit top secret. 
Uh, we got out to Italy, we got picked up in a big chauffeur-driven um, S500 Mercedes. They took us to this amazing hotel. Next minute, knock on the door, there's a tailor tailoring us up with this suit. Like, what on earth is going on here? And um, we went for an evening meal, just nice and chilled. Uh, went back to the room and there was a little parcel on, on, on the table and it was all our suit which had just been tailor-made. There was some Versace aftershave and a little note and he said, welcome to Italy make sure we win this competition tomorrow and uh we played in the competition we won ben was doing all the skills i was just going around absolutely smashing people and uh, that night went out for a proper good evening um we, we went to this fantastic um, banquet they put on and we actually went to donna vitelli's uh, versace's um, um house in milan and it was amazing absolutely amazing so to get these opportunities in one sense i'm speaking at a school where also other players don't want to do it next minute i'm living the dream as an italian flaming superstar so you know these things what comes around goes around that's a great belief of mine so yep yeah, next question when breaking through at manchester united was the person that pushed you who was that person who pushed you that extra mile two people really one is myself i just had this and i don't know whether you have it yourselves when you need to do something you have this sort of the devil on this shoulder saying don't do it it's too hard and what's the point of doing it and you have this other one where it's this like inner grit and determination saying go through the pain barrier just do it you know you don't know what's on the other side but just give it a go and that sort of reminds me now doing this youtube so i just thought no i'm gonna try and do everything and the major the major driver with all this was my father from the gym and with the training we used to do with the um in and around um, football players which was already in the gym olympic lifters who were in the gym um, athletes who were already going to the gym and he pushed me and pushed me in many different ways and um, one of the biggest learning cycles i did was learning to do how, how to do olympic lifting so olympic lifting is a sport which is obviously in the olympics it's two categories it's the snatch where you take the bar from the floor above your head and the clean and jerk where you take the bar from the floor onto your chest and above your head now this is a very technical move and it takes hours and hours of practicing because you want to be safe you don't want to get injured i was lucky enough to go to two national championships where i come third and that was a major major achievement and then i got the opportunity to go to united and it was almost in the right process years and years in the gym then become relatively successful doing a competition and then the opportunity comes and again it's almost like karma so my father and my family and myself pushed me hard once i got to man united it was different again i was i was different to, compared to other players i loved a, a coach called jim ryan jim ryan was like a philosopher he was in charge of me when i was in the reserves and i just i, I liked something about him it wasn't about the drill sergeant in the army it wasn't about the eric harrison and the discipline what Jim offered you was the opportunity to learn if you was willing to listen and start thinking for yourself. So I would say he was key in the development of me as a football player. Next question. Oh, who had the biggest influence on your career at Man United and did you ever receive the Fergie hair dryer treatment? Well, at Man United, Jim Ryan was the major influence on me. I'm sure he was knocking on uh, the manager's door saying give this lad an opportunity uh, i would say i was never seen to be a gold star player as what gets called in the industry where i was a mark to be a first team player but i just kept going and going and going and i think jim saw something deeper within me and alex ferguson at the time we had a major crisis in defense and i was lucky enough to make my debut in uh, november in 1996 against middlesbrough we played against the likes of Ravenelli and Janino and they had a top team back then Middlesbrough it was, but there's a great story I, and I might as well tell you because that's what I'm here to do I never trained with the first team I get the opportunity to travel with the first team to away at Middlesbrough um, it's a big big shock uh, I get there get to the stadium I didn't even think I was going to play I thought I'd maybe be on the bench because I knew there was a few injuries and I walked into the changing room and it had the shirts Smichael Pallister, Clegg, Keane, Beckham, Schools, Cantona. Oh my God, I'm playing. And you know when you have that feeling of absolute fear, but absolute joy at the same time? And then as I sort of 
took a second gulp. I got tapped on the shoulder and I turned around and it was only Bobby Charlton. And I never even met Bobby Charlton before. He put his arm around me and just said, Mike, you are gonna play first team football for Man United, the biggest club in the world. If I can give you one piece of advice, go and enjoy it. And I went and enjoyed it, that was a great day. With great days, you always know you can have bad days as well. And I suppose the biggest criticism or the biggest time I had the Fergie air dryer, we played against Aston Villa um, in a, a Carling Cup game or whatever it was called back then. And we got pumped. I think we got battered 3-1. We had a young squad. It was one of them where it, you, we knew it was an opportunity for us all to have a goal. Me, Ronnie Walwork, Jonathan Greening, John O'Kane, I think Mark Bosnich was in net. So a lot of lads who weren't playing games and sometimes you just get quite out of the cycle. Honestly, Aston Villa that night were brilliant. They destroyed us. Fergie went ballistic and, you know, done quite rightly. And I, had a, I didn't have a good game myself. Other times I've seen him go crazy at the players. I've seen him when he's had stand-up, almost fights with players because he was a, he was a true warrior. Alex Ferguson in that changing room, that was his environment. And when he was doing it properly and when he was not happy, and he wasn't happy about performance, he was always happy about, are you doing the job he's asked you to do? And are you actually um, doing what, what is needed in, in an effort level? So I've seen him go crazy plenty of times. And um, I suppose the stories are as he, as he mellowed, as he got a bit older, but he probably did it a different way. So yeah, I've had the Fergie air, air dryer treatment and believe me, it's, it's not pretty. Next question from your average god. Nice name. So, what is your favourite memory from your time at Man United? Well, again, I just talked about my debut, and of course, them memories can never go. No matter what happens in my life, that was amazing. The second, it was possibly when I come on against Monaco in the quarterfinals of the Champions League. Um, we lost the first leg, 1-0 away at Monaco. 1998, we, we played against them at Old Trafford. I come at half time, and again, it almost took me that back to that feeling when I was uh, the under 16 player. I thought, wow, what an opportunity this is. If I actually do well here, this could really set me up for my life, my career. And I got on it, and I was inspired, and I was running up and down the right wing. I was passing to Canada, and I pass it to Beckham, overlapping. I had a shot, and Barthez just tips it over. And then I mean, my emotion was flying. I don't even know what it was, but I was like, I was, I was possessed with something. And I wanted to stay up for the corner and I was round with a couple of the lads because I was quick, I had to go and stay at the back and I was saying, no chance I'm staying up. I went for an header and um, as I landed, which again, maybe is fate, these things happen, I just thought I'd click my knee a little bit. Oh, my knee was murdering. So from that, it just took a little bit of an edge off me. That game, um, we got to 1-1, Trezeguet played, um, Thierry Henry come on and we ended up drawing 1-1 and I just know if that shot would have gone against Barthez or if we would have won somehow where there was been a miracle goal at the end like used to always happen back then that would have been an amazing start point and platform for the rest of my career but it didn't happen and it's a sliding door situation and um, that, that's just the way it is the other great time was we played against Inter Milan and I can possibly say this was the, I played in lots and lots of friendly games, whether it was in Ireland, whether it was charity games, or whether it was testimonials, but we played in the Paul Ince, uh, move, which when he went to Inter Milan, so Inter Milan come over, but it was a packed house, it was just before the start of the season, and um, I actually went, I got on the pitch, oh, of course, uh, and I went up for a corner, the ball come in, and I edited it in, and it went past Buffon, and I got some great pictures from the past and maybe we can share one of these in the future. But I got Saltzgar coming over to give me a good, good cuddle, Beckham's high five and me, Brian McClare's giving me a big squeeze and Jordi Cruyff's there and it's a great picture. I look at that again and think that's a major, major uh, you know, feeling. It's, and again, about lots of things I'm going to talk about in the future. The feeling is the key to what I think brings a better life. So the feeling of all them emotional things is what stands out in life create the feeling next question so this is from jack wall when working with all those top players which player made the biggest improvement in terms of body condition and strength so again it's i'll probably take this back to when i was at, at sunderland and the likes of jordan henderson who, again who developed as a young player who looking quite weak and then was an absolute unit and he's kicked on but there's many occasions of that uh, where players 
diminutive, they're quite small, they, they're learning about themselves, they go through a growth spurt and then they become the player they had. So for instance, we had Johnny Evans who comes to Sunderland uh, from Man United on loan. Again, he did the same, he was small, but he knew there was something in there. He was bright, he was talented, he was confident. And once his body started to develop, he'd become a top player as, as what he still is now playing, playing in the Premier League. We had Danny Rose who come to our place. And again, from Tottenham, he wasn't quite getting in the first team, come to Sunderland, had a great spell, worked with him plenty. He kicked on top player. Marcus Alonso come to Sunderland, now he's a top player at Chelsea. So there's lots of these uh, um, players who come, they want to develop, they want to learn. And there's equally lots of players who come and they want to do as little as possible and they don't want to be in the gym. And again, that comes down to education, comes down to their past training history. And there's always going to be that really up for things and don't quite want to do things. And you know, I could slag a few players off, but this is not the moment in time. I'm sure when we get more detailed and questions and people will ask me deeper things, there'll be the occasion where I can be critical as well as positive. Next question from Jordi Parry. What could you do to help young footballers speak up or seek help with mental health issues? As a public figure, I believe you can impact and break some of the stigma which still surrounds footballers and men who suffer in silence. Well, Jordi, this is something which is absolutely massive at the moment. This is a very, very current topic, which is emotional in many ways and lots of ways bad. And yes, there is this big swing from even with other departments of life where there's been lots of historical cases of mental health issues due to all types of, whether it's people doing things wrong to children or whether it's people um, speaking very badly to people. And they've obviously got issues which only down the road are they brave enough to speak about. But really these things have got to be nipped in the bud. So there's got to be a network, there's got to be a system where people can report issues and all the time it's, 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 it's a difficult one because people, especially in a football environment, especially in, in an elitist environment, you, you don't want to be the person complaining about something because you might look weak. When we was at Man United, we had the psychologist there, brilliant guy, good friend of mine called Bill Bezik. And even back then, I was worried about speaking to him. That was about sports performance. So when you talk about mental health, not even sport related, it becomes very difficult. And I've got a few stories I will share in the future about my own beliefs, about mental health, about issues within my own family. And ultimately, I'll, this has to be solved. And one thing which is, again, a warning to uh, football coaches, football clubs, parents, children themselves is there is, a, I think there's a, there's a mental health time bomb which is going to happen. And I think it's something which is really, really serious. But without going into detail, because I will actually do a YouTube video completely on this, and I will bring in some experts in the field when I start to do my podcast and interviews, because I think this is something which has got to be taken really, really seriously. But thank you, Jordy. Good question. Next question. This is from Daniel. You got to travel to a lot of great places as a footballer. What was your favourite trip that you went on? Okay, Daniel, there were some amazing trips and I've been on amazing trips with Man United. I've been on amazing trips with Sunderland. And for a football player to have the opportunity to go to these amazing places where really you would never actually pay to go because you wouldn't choose that as an holiday with the family. You get to see all these locations and these weird and wonderful places for free, which is great. The bad thing is sometimes all you see is the aeroplane, you see the airport, you see the bus, you see the hotel, you see the training ground, you see the stadium and you back out. So it's very difficult to create the opportunities to really relax and enjoy the moment. But a couple of the places which I loved, and I mean really, really loved it, showed me the other side of the world. We did a, an amazing tour where we went to um, Australia, we went to Melbourne, went to Sydney, we went to Shanghai and Hong Kong and back. And believe me, that was amazing. First time and the only time I've ever, ever traveled first class. And I was looking up back then, so it was obviously before 9-11, where I was allowed in the cockpit and I sat with the pilots as we landed into Melbourne. And that was an unbelievable, unbelievable trip. And we had a great time and we ended up having an amazing party on a, on a yacht just outside, um, Pearl, um, outside the, the, the harbour there on Sydney and the bridge. Incredible. You, you, 
I swear you cannot buy these opportunities, you cannot buy these uh, moments in time. And then to fly off then and go to Hong Kong and, um, and to Shanghai. Shanghai, I just remember I was on the top of this, I think it was like 100 floors, and I was looking that way, and it was like skyscrapers and high rise flats as far as I could see. That way the same, that way the same. I just thought, oh, what? The Never seen anything like it. It makes Manchester look like a Lego set. And then went to Hong Kong. Hong Kong, never seen anything like it. We're on the plane, but to actually land, you had to, you had to actually twist with the plane to miss the high rise flats. And you, you basically think, what on earth is going on? Because you're so near to the floor, and you can see into somebody's living room. Again, incredible. But that airport's changed. I think it became a bit of a health issue, and now they've made a big um, Hong Kong airport, which is built from reclaimed land in the sea. So again, another another emotion, another memory which people from now can't have. So I have been blessed with this. So great question. Next question. Looking forward, um, did you keep a lot of things from your playing career to look back on programs, match reports, shirts, etc.? This is from Man United collectors. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, guys, listen, you're, you're into that industry. Um, it's something which possibly wasn't done as much back then as what is done now. And people collect everything and everybody takes pictures and they sort of always documenting their lives. Back then it wasn't much that. And believe me, back then it wasn't like that because we had Roy Keane as our sort of captain and Roy Keane hated that thing. So I wouldn't even dream of swapping a shirt. It occasionally got done where um, Albert the kit man would come in or occasionally if um, a player come over to you to swap your shirt, you would do it. Um, but I've got some stuff and I've got some great memories again. Um, I got the top when I played against Marseille, the top against Monaco, uh, the top when I played against G Ginola. Um, I had a massive battle with Vinnie Jones and managed to get his shirt. So there's some great stuff. I've got some um, and programs which are, are lovely. But I probably didn't collect enough. What I did get was lots and lots of United shirts because you get supplied with them. Bags fulls of all the shirts I played in and then my training shirts and also my match shirts. It's only now, as of transitioning from my football career to my strength and conditioning career to now, people said, can we buy a shirt off you? Can we, can we put it to our collection? I'm thinking, well, not really. I've got about three shirts from my United days. I was reminded because I give them to all my mates. I actually give them to my friends and I give them to my family back in the day because they was interested. They was interested in my story, what I was doing. And I give them a shirt as a, as a thank you for all the help they've given me. So I've probably not got enough and I certainly haven't got enough to like fill out some type of internal museum. So maybe I missed out on that. Next question. Was there a particular group or individual that younger players could turn to for support and advice at United? Someone specifically employed by the club rather than a senior player. This is from Cleggers United 68, potential um, family member, but I don't think it is. Um, but thanks for the question. Uh, it's an interesting one. Uh, again, back then, that provision probably wasn't really thought about in the sense of safeguarding, which is massive now. Looking back, you probably did have two or three key people who you would link into. And again, that could have been very different depending on who you was and who you had a connection to. I certainly used to speak quite a lot to our dietitian. Um, he was a great guy. Um, who else did we used to? We had a vicar. We had a reverend there, Reverend John, and he's still a part of the club now. I think he's retiring. So there were certain people there, but there wasn't almost like a HR arm where you could go and seek advice from. Without doubt, you, you tried to link in with players who you knew. And there was, there was agents who, who was obviously trying to get your attention. The agents who would offer you advice, was that good or bad? I don't know, because I never got one. Did I fail there? Maybe. I should have got an agent and moved on. I never got one. I believe what Alex Ferguson said to me. Cleggy, if you do well, I'll give you a new contract. I got a one-year contract. I did reasonably well. Made me first-team debut. Got a two-year contract. Played in Europe. Got a three-year contract. Played again three or four times. Five times, give me another contract. So in one sense, there's advice on everywhere. And believe me, when you first start making your Man United career, you start getting the first team. Everybody wants to get your advice. I think there's only two or three people you need to take advice from. One is the manager, because ultimately, if you play good football, the money will come anywhere. Your parents, make sure you, you look after them and you have a real tight family bond. And then maybe there should be somebody who knows about the game, 
who can give you best practice and understanding maybe about contracts, maybe about how to control your money and maybe how to um, make sure you don't start doing stupid things because these lads who get a lot of money now, they're very young and they can certainly make mistakes. And again, this will sort of fall into our seven dimensions of health, which we're going to talk a lot about over the coming series of, of um, YouTube talks and um, podcasts. Next question. Sunderland that we do not know from... So the question here, I think, from Harvey is Sunderland have recently done a Netflix documentary and it was, wow, I was there. I went through an amazing emotional roller coaster. So I leave Man United, I go and play for Oldham, struggle big time. And again, we'll start talking about why this happened. I retire early, 26, not injured. Could have gone to a couple of other clubs. I had a f people knocking on the door. But I thought, no, I need to make a career change. I need to be brave. I need to go and do something which I, I'm proud about, something which I love. So I went back to the my dad's gym, started doing strength and conditioning, loved it. The very first day I trained my auntie, my auntie Jackie, and I just got this amazing feedback loop where you're actually doing something for somebody else and you're getting feedback which is amazing. Sometimes as a player you become a little bit selfish and for the team and I just got this feedback where I'm actually helping somebody and it made me, I know what it does now, it releases certain chemicals into the system but it made me feel good and I thought this is right for me, this is where I want to be. I spent the next two years learning and honing that craft and Roy Keane took me to Sunderland, he went up there as the manager, uh, a new company called the Drummerville Consortium um, just took over the club and um, Niall Quinn took the first six games, lost all six. So Niall Quinn, top guy, possibly not the best manager, but that doesn't matter. Roy King goes in, he brings his people with him. So I come in with him, Raymond van der Gaal, the goalkeeper, come in with him. Neil Bailey, brilliant coach, uh, works for the PFA now. Um, we all went in and we create this atmosphere of, you know, never give in. Atmosphere of discipline, do things right express yourself as football players and that first season we become champions we got promoted and from that point we stayed in the Premier League ever since Roy ended up moving away um, once the the ownership of the club changed again Ellis Short come in Roy Moody went to Ipswich I ended up staying at the club working under Steve Bruce and a whole raft of other managers and we'll talk about this in the future the different managers the different styles but the last two years were the difficult years we got relegated when Dave Moyes was the manager from the Premier League to the Championship. And then when we was in the Championship, the club was on its knees financially. And ultimately, we ended up having a strange season where we was under so much pressure. Um, big changes at the board level all the way down. Staff members lost their jobs, but we had the Netflix documentary um, recording every moment of everything what was going on. And without doubt, you need to watch the show. It's a real good insight of what happens in a football club. Um, from the chairman all the way down to um, Joyce, the lady who serves us our food, an amazing woman, and, and everything in between the players and the good things and the bad things and the fans and the emotions. And it's a great documentary. But the best thing about the documentary is the theme song at the start. It's absolutely cracking. Every time I watched uh, an episode, it brought a tear to my eye. And good luck to the guy. I don't even know his name. Brilliant artist, and I hope he does top draw. Um, and they're doing another series this year. It's going out again at the end of the season. They've got a new manager, Jack Ross. They've got a new owner, Stuart Donald. They've gone in there. They're doing some amazing things. They've got some quality staff members still in there. Um, head of physio, Peter Brand, and Paul Walsh, head of sports scientist, and others. And they're doing a really good job. And I wish them all the luck in the world. I love Sunderland as well. I've, I still live there. I've been living there 12 years. My wife, Laura, is from Sunderland. My two children live in Sunderland. And uh, Sunderland is deep in my heart. And it was always going to be because it's red, white, and black. Next question. Lee Byers has asked me a question. Just saying, good luck, Mike. It'll be an interesting watch. Well, I hope everybody's enjoying the, the show. And uh, I know I'm rambling on. And a few of you might have turned off. And a few of you might be interested and be willing to subscribe and uh, want to see what happens and what I talk about each week. So if you do, brilliant. Appreciate it. And in the future, there'll be all types of things going on from quizzes to you guys. We'll probably be doing some uh, different um, giveaways and speaking to different clients and different football players. Football players currently playing 
um, football players of the future, football players from the past, but specialists in other areas through the seven dimensions I was talking about before. Even yesterday I was speaking to an expert in the field of sleep, um, she's from America, and there's a big community of people who, through me, want to help people throughout the world to be as healthy as possible and to be inspired and to be as productive as possible in their home life, in their work life, and in their life in general. So I'm looking forward to the rest of the um, YouTube um, questions which you might ask. And um, please subscribe and ask your friends to subscribe as well because it's going to be interesting, fun, interactive, and thank you very much.